Hey, welcome to the No State Project here on LRN. Whoa, whoa, what the hell am I doing? Uh, well, that's the business. You know, hey, I had to do something to screw things up because I think my tech issues are, are uh, you know, I don't think we're going to have any today. Although I may be saying that a little bit too soon there. But uh, welcome to this uh, broadcast, the seventh episode of the No State Project, live on Wednesday. It is January 4, 2017. Glad to be with you here. Glad people are tuning in, I hope. Uh, I got a lot of stuff to get to. Um, before I take uh, the calls, are 218 632 9399. That's 218 632 9399. And uh, a couple things I want to discuss before we start taking calls, though. But you can also get me on Skype at Frank Rizzo3. And I can put you into the Skype chat. Uh, again, this is episode seven. I want to pr- thank everyone for the continued support of the show. Uh, if you're able to throw a few bucks at the show for production costs, as you could tell, we don't have a lot of money at all for production costs, which is why we're stuck with this wonderful 360 in 2016. But hey, it's the audio that's important, right? A um, couple of things here. I notice a few people that are complaining that. Um, <clears throat> prosecutors are not responding in you know to phone calls they won't speak to them uh, so they just basically uh, refuse to speak to you when you're asking questions of evidence and that's kind of a common thing prosecutors tend to be very very uh, intellectually inferior people as far as well I should say emotionally inferior where uh, they don't like being challenged they don't like you being asked questions and maybe some of them it's just uncomfortable because they're persecuting they don't want they don't want their victims talking to them they don't want to see that their their victims are actually human beings just like them uh, so it's a lot easier when you're trying to destroy someone's life just to kind of talk to the hand them uh, but it's not altogether necessary to speak to the prosecutor to be able to get one of these things thrown out. Uh, thank goodness for that. Uh, so if they want to do something like that, and again, I'll throw out that they do have a legitimate reason if you are represented by an attorney. So when someone's represented by an attorney and a lawyer legally may not speak to that person and could actually be disbarred for that. But when you're doing it on your own pro per, you're defending yourself, there's no ethical or good faith reason for the prosecution to refuse to speak to you. So uh, keep that in mind uh, when they do that. Uh, see, the big thing here to remember is that it's, you know, even though it's not necessary, okay, I said it was January 4th, right, 2016? Is that, yeah, I, I'm trying to, trying to multitask over here. Um, the important thing is that the Brady request, their, op, their responsibility to comply with Brady by giving you exculpatory evidence starts from the moment the complaint is filed against you all the way through appeals. So if something is discovered two years later while this is on appeal, they could still have a Brady violation. If they had the information that was relevant to uh, impeaching one of their witnesses, and they deliberately did not give that to you. That is a huge due process violation and grounds for a reversal, even on appeal. So the Brady continues regardless. So let them be, you know, uh, it, it, let them be jerks about it. They are still responsible to respond to you in writing to the Brady request. And why is the Brady request so important? Like I said, it's exculpatory. Any evidence that's relevant to showing that their witnesses can be impeached so that the witnesses are not credible or competent, that is supposed to be dis- disclosed to you on a Brady request, which is in writing. So very briefly, the foundation of the prosecution's case, the very foundation, everything is built on that. Nothing else is relevant without it is the single claim that if you're physically in Arizona, their constitution, their rules apply to you. That is the basis of territorial jurisdiction, personum jurisdiction, and subject matter jurisdiction. They have to have a witness with personal knowledge of that. It is an element of the charge. It's also part of the burden of proof, and the only way to prove territorial and personal jurisdiction. So let them be jerks. Let them refuse to speak to you. Fine. Give me an answer in writing 
to the Brady request. And yes, it has to be in writing. So if they know that the witness doesn't have personal first-hand knowledge on the Rule 602 with the Rules of Evidence, they have to disclose that to you. They have to, in writing, very clearly state, Police Officer A does not have personal knowledge of this. Oh, and how do we know they know the witness doesn't have personal knowledge? When he's on the stand on cross-examination and you ask him for evidence proving the Constitution and code apply to you because that is the argument that he made to justify the stop, that's his probable cause, oh, the prosecution will suddenly be in agreement with you. The witness doesn't have personal knowledge. They will argue that their own witness is not competent or credible. Imagine it. So they are required to give that to you, but they don't do that. They don't like to do that because it makes them look really bad. It makes them, uh, well, it's evidence of a crime. It's abuse of process. It's obstruction of justice. It is prosecutorial misconduct to argue without evidence. Yet the critics did a show, the two or three that we do have, because we only have a handful, when the truth is that simple and easy to show, you don't get many critics. Uh, yeah, you do have to prove it. You do have to prove it. And irrefutable presumptions are a violation of due process. They are not fair. They are evidence, hardcore evidence of a raid game. Also, I want to address here, I need to talk about appeal procedure, but I don't know if we're going to have time uh, during this broadcast. Although, this is, uh, we do have no commercials here, which is nice. Um, someone is also complaining about clerks not accepting paperwork now sometimes this happens in a situation like that you're probably going to have to get something from the post office to prove that it's going there that they're actually physically getting it and if they, they then are, are refusing get their names down if you can hell if you can get a picture of these people get a picture of them you take their name the date that you went and spoke to them that they're refusing to accept the paperwork file a complaint with the presiding judge file a complaint with the city council or the mayor's office or if it's the county the county commission make a stink for this damn clerk so that they'll never forget who you are and they're not supposed to exercise discretion there that's something we're going to talk about as far as the uh the appeals they're just supposed to accept properly formatted documents it's not up to them to not accept the paperwork so somebody was uh, re relaying in the, in the chat that clerk was actually threatening to have someone arrested ah you could uh, this is why they don't want your cell phones in there because you can't arrest them with their antisocial yeah you can't record their antisocial behavior just clerks for heaven's sakes and if it's traffic court they're glorified cashiers they're, they're, they're no better than these people working at more well, i shouldn't say that uh, their job is no more difficult than a cashier at mcdonald's or walmart all they're doing is collecting money Ay, yeah, yeah, these people. Oh, my gosh. All right, let's get to the calls over there here. Hopefully, we don't have a repeat of the, what happened on the live broadcast uh, the other day, uh, the LRN broadcast. Right, then we have a new caller, Airy Code 209. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Tony. I'm calling from uh, Los Banos, California, Area Code 209. <laughs> we have a... I don't know if, I think it's on your end because there's a real bad buzzing and background noise. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you fine. It's just that there's a horrible background noise. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, um, looks like I'm going to have to try and get back with you then if you can't deal with it. It's, yeah, it's pretty bad. So if you can call me on another line or just Skype me the, uh, the question, then I can address it on air. Thanks a lot, Mark. All right, appreciate the call. Uh, sure. Wow, that, that. That is really unfortunate. But, hey, I don't think that was from my end, so we've got that going for us. So hopefully uh, Tony can get back with me on a different line or Skype me at Frank Rizzo 3. That's Frank Rizzo with the number 3. So what we'll do is we'll go to, uh, we got uh, Jay in Texas. Jay, welcome to the No State Project, <laughs> the commercial-free edition of the No State Project. What do you got for us today, big guy? Hey, Mark, how you doing, bud? I'm doing well. What do you got for us today, Ed, Jay? Uh, I went ahead and purchased your book, uh, Government Indicted, and uh, it's hard to put down, I'll tell you that. Uh, 
and it's a lot to take in. I sent you a few emails trying to kind of cut to the chase so I can move my, my project along a little faster, and I think I found what I was looking for um, as far as what I need to send to Florida on that DUI charge. Okay. As far as the paperwork. Now, I wanted to clarify with you first and foremost <clears> – <throat> Um, I did find where, you know, how to structure a uh, motion to dismiss. Now, is a motion to, is, is the structure going to be the same in this situation, uh, uh, or am I going to do a motion to quash? And, and I know I've asked this before, but we kind of get, we get a little confused, and I guess I get confused. Uh, okay. What do I, before, even before that, I read in your book that you call prosecutors or attorney's offices prior to sending anything in. Do you think that's a good idea on my part? I, th I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I always think it's a good idea as long as you are just asking Brady-related and evidentiary questions and you're not answering any of their questions. Right, so calling them and – and, and making them aware that I am trying to resolve this issue and I intend to file uh, for a Brady request, I intend to file for a motion to quash or vacate um, and see what they have to say. Uh, you can let them know. You can, you can let them know that you are also filing a Brady request. Let them know that they, let, right. and, and, you know, that, that is very, very important. The Brady request is very important. So uh, just to reiterate for everybody, it doesn't matter if formal discovery is premature prior to a plea. The Brady request and the Brady material is, is something the prosecution has to provide still. So even if they shoot back at you, I don't have to give you discovery yet, or, hey, we're in New York, dead jerky. We don't have to give you pretrial discovery. You still have to have the Brady material. They're on the hook for that as soon as the complaint is filed. It's a continuing obligation. So don't listen to them when they lie to you. And if they lie to you, document it and file a complaint against them with the Bar Association and, uh, and, and uh, a city council or wherever they happen, or city or county, and file a complaint against them. This son of a bitch lied to me. He told me he wasn't required to give me this information, and it's not true. Brady is a continuing obligation to the prosecution. As much as they want to fight that, uh, it's still a continuing obligation. So what I would do is I would, I would just change. I have a motion to dismiss already written out, uh, if you, it, it, which you know, would take a lot of the work away from you. But what you want to do is you want to just change the title because you're trying to quash a warrant. So you would title a motion to quash and then maybe file a separate motion to dismiss. But you're really going to be raising a lot of the same issues. Hell, did we lose? Jay. Hmm. Okay, we still have Jay. All right, well, it looks like we're going to have more tech issues uh, with a call line this time. You know, what can you, hey, what can you do? Oh, yeah, that's right. I, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, so, uh, that's what you would do as far as the structure. You keep the same structure, but you're going to be changing the title. All the issues about a, a lack of evidence proving jurisdiction uh, are going to be the same for the quash as it's going to be for the motion to dismiss. So it's all the same underlying issues. Uh, what I would also do is file a separate motion, one page long, letting them know, hey, I'm in Texas, and you want the motions heard telephonically. And you could even put in there, like we've discussed on the show before, I'm not going to subject myself to arrest when there is not a single shred of evidence in the record to prove territorial or personum jurisdiction. So let alone they can't show subject matter jurisdiction because it's a code violation. And for there to be a code violation, again, I know, logic, you have to have proof that the code applies first before you can prove that it was violated. So they can't, that's why we've been successful too, I believe, in California with the demur, because even their own code says that there has to be sufficient facts to set forth a violation. Sufficient facts. If you don't have any evidence that the code applies, 
And you don't have an essential element because you're just assuming. And that the code and fairness and due process require not assumptions. That's not how you make a prima facie case. Gosh, there's this one troll on, on my YouTube channel. She thinks all you have to, it's a presumably a woman, all you have to do to shift the burden on somebody is make an accusation. <laughs> Are you that mind-numbingly ignorant? Are you just that bad of a troll to think that a prima facie case is made and a burden is shifted just because you make an allegation without a shred of evidence to back it up? So if I say that you're a pedophile, now the burden shifts to you to prove you're not? What the... This is, the, this is the level of trolling that these videos have because there's nothing of substance. That and just flat out lying. Mark has not produced one single court case number where the motion to dismiss has been granted. And then you file or you do videos and you have articles with the actual documents there unredacted and then they have to lie. Well, it had nothing to do with the motion. Yes, the judge granted the motion, but he grant, but it, he, he, he didn't, it, it had, had to do with grounds other than the motion. See, the judge can, if the judge was going to throw a, a, a ticket out, he doesn't have to grant my motion. He can throw it out on, sua sponte, they call it. He could do it on his own motion. The fact he granted the motion, but the, these, these trolls, that's where I think there's evidence that these people are being paid to do that because no one is that willfully ignorant. No one is that willfully blind on these things. No one normal who's a normal adult is going to turn around and, and keep moving the damn goalposts like that. Good Lord. Even the one on LRN.FM backed off of his stupid uh, uh, false claims against me. He stopped moving the goalposts, and, and it doesn't wrench my name anymore. Thank goodness. So, um, yeah, to get back to Jay in Texas, hopefully that is all you need to do. Uh, and hopefully you can get it, a, get it telephonically. Uh, because there's no reason why you should have to travel out there that far and put yourself in jeopardy when the prosecution to this point has not set forth a prima facie case. And no, just having a complaint is not a prima facie case unless the complaint actually has descriptions of evidence proving the proposition, proving the claim is true. If not, no, because I mentioned this before we tried Jay, uh, uh, Tony again in California. Even the IRS, when you're talking about taxes, and this is in Commissioner versus Adamson. I don't remember the case citation off the top of my head, but people like Jay in Texas who have a copy of government indicted, it is in there. Because what you'll see is that the burden of proof, even for the IRS, a terrorist, American terrorist organization, their burden of proof does not shift to you or me or they're to their victim unless the assessment is based on evidence, proof. Allegations are not proof. So you can say, well, society chose to create a government and then that government passes laws. Now the burden of shift, now the burden shifts to you, Mark. You prove that that's wrong. Ah, that's not how things work and that's not how you do things as an adult. No. If you have proof that the people did that, yeah, now you've made a prima facie case and the burden shifts to show where your facts are wrong or your argument is, is illogical. But not just making a damn allegation. Gee, maybe that's what we should do. Just start... Uh, anyway, let me see what we got back here with Tony. Maybe Tony's on a better line. Tony, baby, what are you, you better now. Give us a check. How about that, Mark? A little hey, better? hey, that that's that's a whole lot better. So, all right, great. So, what do we got going over here? Uh, I got two issues, but uh, I won't drag them out for you. Um, the first one I got is basically um, I ended up going through a uh, uh, divorce a couple of years ago, and uh, it appears as though my ex-wife ended up having a, a falling out with uh, basic life in general, and she didn't end up paying her attorney which is, you know, pretty much bad juju. Um, and I got a court order stipulating that my wife, my ex-wife, is to go ahead and sign a quick claim deed releasing her obligations, her rights, her future claims on said property of community property with me. 
since she didn't pay her attorney, uh, her attorney in turn, even though this was a court order saying that there is uh, a separation once I buy out her interest, which I did, she signed the quick claim deed, her attorney in turn decides to go ahead and slap her with uh, a lien. Now, since I can't refi my home or get her off of my title because of this lien, that puts me in a bind because that makes that subjects me to an obligation of paying her um, her attorney until I can end up getting that uh, that lien satisfied. Once that lien satisfied, she'll release the lien. Then I can end up uh, paying her. So my question is, basically in general, looking at, again, where is your proof that I'm subject to anything, any of this lean um, propaganda that you're saying that applies to me? You know, if I satisfy everything that the court says to do, I buy her out, she signs a quick claim deed, uh, and even in the paperwork it says I'm to keep her free from harm. Uh, and she in turn is to keep me free from harm, but she doesn't have the financial authority to do so because she's basically living in her car. You know that that's not my issue. My issue is why why are you coming after me or putting putting claim on my property? Well, it, it sounds to me that the the attorney violated the court order. She doesn't have an interest he, in the property, so how could he put how he how can he and she he or she can't put a valid lien on there. And they probably did that knowing they probably they weren't able to do that. So my first thought on this is to file a motion to uh, release the lien with the with the divorce court for, and, and hold and have sanctions against the attorney. They had to have known this and have sanctions against the attorney for doing that because it's, de- you know, it's causing you it's causing you problems. Uh, it's definitely causing me problems. I mean, I'm looking at it as number one. For me to go ahead and try and deal with refinancing or whatever, it's pretty much damaged my name. It's damaged the title of my property. Um, I'm I'm right now just up against a rock right now. Well, that the only thing I could I think the best thing is like I said, you're gonna have to file in the divorce court because you know those are ongoing kind of things unless it's on appeal. And you filed to have this attorney held, uh, you know, held not only for sanctions, but of course, you know, to to release the lien as soon as possible because it's damaging you. Yeah, it's not going to um, be done in a week, but at least that gets the ball going, and the judge presumably is going to uphold their own court order. Well, that's the thing. I'm, I've supplied them with all of the exhibits uh, stating a future, um, basically the very last court order or a very less uh, court appearance, and uh, the judge writing in her own handwriting um, all of the stipulations that are connected to that contract because the judge says, well, you'll do X, Y, and Z. Do you agree to be bound by this? And I said yes. The ex-wife said yes. As far as I'm concerned, that's a legal contract that's been accepted and adopted by the court. It seems pretty straightforward to me. Tony, that's what I that's that's what I would do. I you know I, I, you probably have to even if there are other remedies available, you probably have to start there because the only way to get the only other way to get that lien released is to satisfy it, and that shouldn't have to happen when you've got a court order that no no. That's why I would get a motion to like I said to vacate or release the lien immediately to the to the court like this week if you can and hold that. Sc- hold that lawyer accountable. They had to have known. Yeah. Um, that That's pretty much uh, what I'm dealing with in issue number one. Well, real quick, uh, just, I, I would, gonna... well, real quick, before we get to issue number two, I would still, you know, it, it still would give the attorney the benefit of, the, uh, of any kind of doubt and call them first and see if they, look, you know, are you on aware that she's already filed a quick claim deed on this property? You have a, you have a false lien against me. Oh, let me. I one thing I did leave out. Um, she was already sent a notice of cease and desist and to release the lien, uh, which in turn she sent a, pretty much a nasty gram back. Oh, so they've already 
Okay, so you've already made the good faith effort. Now you got to go to court. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. Well, what's what's issue number two? Uh, issue number two is a fun one that I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with. Um, I ended up uh, while I was at divorce court. Um, uh, there, they have roving parking patrol. A parking attendant um, over here in Merced County drives up and tags my vehicle with a uh, a parking ticket for a unregistered vehicle. And I've been, like I said, I've been listening to your show. Uh, and following a lot of your paperwork for going on almost three years now. And I pretty much know the ins and outs, and I've already dealt with one or two uh, speeding infractions literally for like three miles an hour over, seven miles an hour over, and I've I've won all of those. And the method does work. If you stand by your guns, don't be afraid of, you know, the child in the robe, and for him to sit here and say, well, you can't do this, and you owe us X, Y, and Z money, well, where's your proof? So getting back to the uh, – she ended up writing the ticket or the notice to appear, uh, basically is what it was, uh, for an unregistered vehicle. So I, in turn, go ahead and challenge it, and because it's parking, they say that you're not entitled to any sort of confrontation or challenge of the jurisdiction. Just go ahead and pay it, and then it's over and done with. You know, it never goes before a judge. Well, that's true, but it so still feel- it still goes in front of an administrative hearing officer. So there is still, and it may not they may not allow you to question the agent. I'm trying to be nice, <laughs> they they may not let you confront the agent, but they're still supposed to be an administrative process. And I've helped people in California all the time. We have we have where we've had them thrown out at marshstevens.net. So uh, someone is not telling you the truth. That's just wrong. Yeah, exactly. So I have went ahead and I've challenged, and they basically said that, well, you can go ahead and request for an administrative hearing. We can't guarantee it's going to happen because, <laughs> number one, again, this is a traffic ticket. So once I went ahead and I did the request, and I've – sent to the DA and the police department um, a request for Brady material. You know, they denied everything, and they said, well, you know what, just go ahead and pay it. And, oh, by the way, because you waited to go ahead and submit this, and because it took time for you to get a response back from us, time has, the time has expired for you to go ahead and uh, – make any sort of claim or challenge because the uh, I'm trying to think of what the actual term is where statute of limitations expired or something along those lines. So basically after me making numerous phone calls and actually getting in contact with the uh, police chief over in uh, Merced County where this happened, uh, basically – that chief talking to him on a Wednesday, I believe, made a phone call to my city police chief on Thursday. And I walk out in my front yard, and my vehicle is up on a tow truck and being towed away. So I go on out, and I question the police officers right then and there. And I ask them, basically, where's your proof that any of this stuff applies? Why do you have my vehicle up on a wrecker and you taking it away? Oh, wait a minute. If you're going to go ahead and take my vehicle, where is my parking ticket that you guys are supposed to issue me saying, well, we're taking it because of so-and-so? I, they because, just showed up. Because of so-and-so? Well, so-and-so because of it basically having expired registration. You know, they're basically, from what I believe, going off of the phone call that I had the previous day with the police chief from another city. So... Regardless, I mean, it's it's just ironic. I get off the phone one day, and the next day, police officers are just driving around the neighborhood looking because they have nothing better to do. They're looking for um, vehicles with expired registration. And it's not an abandoned vehicle. It was clean. It was a, a very expensive 4x4. So they decide to go ahead and take the vehicle. 
Jeez. Um, Steal it, you mean? And what's they? <laughs> yeah, they. I'm I'm pretty much out of a vehicle, so I pretty much do everything that I possibly can to go ahead and acquire it back. Uh, and I go down to the police department, and I ask them point blank, as well as the district attorney's office, which is right next door. You guys showed up to my residence. You took my vehicle. Um, I'm trying to get it back, and I'm not gonna just end up paying you guys a thousand bucks to go ahead and get it back. Where's your proof that I owe you anything? or that we're going through all of this, where is it that you guys can prove that this applies to me? And basically they said, well, we don't have any. It's just that the vehicle was unregistered. We're going to go ahead and take it. So I go on over to the tow company where it was at. Within 15 days, they applied for title. They sold it. Holy crap. So I asked, okay, so if you guys are going to go ahead and do this, and you sold it, you got back what you were owed for the tow. The city got what they were owed for the registration, or the Department of Motor Vehicles was got what they were required for the registration. Where is the residual leftover? Who gets that? I want to see record of everything. They are not providing any evidence or any information as to what happened to the rest of the money. Um, they're they're not even giving me the information how much it's sold for. Oh man, so, this this is bad. This is bad. At least, but you you have the information on the vehicle. I would I would file a complaint like as soon as possible with the their uh, with the uh, who who did this? Was it city police or or was it county? No, it was city police. Now this is the thing. I've already gone to the risk assessment or uh, claims department. And I've already filed a claim with them. Oh. And they took five and a half months to respond. And they said that if you don't um, send a complaint within six months, then you don't necessarily have a claim or a right to uh, make a complaint. They ended up sending um, a response back saying that your claim is denied. Okay. So I'm looking at this. um, Okay. My claim is denied. Um, and you guys are telling me that I have six months from the date of injury to go ahead and actually get something started. So that literally left me, uh, no, according to no, you've rules, told the time, you've told the time limit though. You filed the, you filed the risk management claim within the six months. Are they trying to say that the filing court is six months from the date yeah. of injury? Yes, exactly. I'm pretty sure that, that filing the insurance claim tolls that. In fact, you know, I, 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 I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure. So what are you saying? You, 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 they, they took so long to turn it down that you only have a few days, if any, to file in small claims against them? Exactly. How many days do you have? <laughs> it's, it's already expired. It ended up uh, at the end of October. So I've been trying to look at this whole deal and figure out what my last, you know, couple of avenues are, which basically are to actually go against or, or, or go into small claims against the two police officers that showed up and who took my vehicle, and then um, against the tow company, because neither one of them showed up with a warrant. Uh, then neither one of them showed up with any evidence that proves that uh, just because my vehicle was expired that the California vehicle code applies to me. Um, I'm looking at all of this stuff and I'm like, you guys could just arbitrarily show up to someone's residence and steal their vehicle under color of law and say that it applies. That's what they do every and day. Then, it's really surprising that, though, with just a registration that they didn't just give you a damn ticket and give you the opportunity to get the vehicle back. That's kind of extreme. Somebody was, I, I mean, I'm sure it's happened many times before, but, I don't remember anyone in California telling me about the vehicle being being taken from them and sold that fast for a registration ticket. I mean, did they even charge yeah. you? I mean, did you go to court on the no registration ticket? No, that, see, that's the thing. That's The parking ticket was the, uh, the parking citation was the registration. It wasn't that I was parked in a handicap zone. It wasn't that I was parked in two spots. It was, I was parked in a county parking lot 
in a vehicle that had expired registration. Okay, got it. Wow, but still to seize the, I mean, without, oh, man, what a bunch of, and they wonder why there are call dragas in the world. And for those trolling, that's why, that's why, when you take all remedy away from people and keep screwing them and screwing them, I would still look into, I think you can still, I think as you told the time, you did make a formal legal claim against them. I think that tolls the time. If you had just waited six months and didn't file a claim anywhere, well, then, yeah, you, you're SOL. But here, I don't think that applies. I would still file into the small claims against the insurance company and, of course, the, you know, the, the tow company as accessories. Because bottom line, well, then again, you know, I'm saying, I had to catch myself about the immunity thing. Uh, the tow company probably has immunity. This, I would have to check the code. They probably, because it's like banks. Banks have immunity if the IRS orders them to take in your funds and wipe you out. You have no legal recourse against the bank, period. So that may be the case here. The tow company may have looking, immunity. I was looking more along the lines of wrongful transfer of stolen goods on the uh, tow company. Yeah, hey, you could probably hey. file a mechanics lien against the tow company. That's the other thing I was thinking. I mean, it, it to me it doesn't really make that much sense that you can legitimately show up, take someone's property, uh, go ahead and apply for new titleship, and then go ahead and just sell it off. Well, they yeah, well th that's the way they do it. They're accusing you of a crime, and then they're forfeiting and taking it and selling it. What what real what also gets my goat here are all the. Are all the bloodthirsty people, the money grubbing, the money grubbers who buy the vehicles from the cops. And all that money stays off budget. So every dollar that they made from the sale of your car that they stole stays with the police department. I'm yeah, sure they, exactly. It goes right into the city coffer. Um, yeah, they kick some up to Pauly. You got to kick some up to Pauly, of course. <laughs> F you, pay me. So uh, that's what I would do, uh, Tony. I, I would uh, file a mechanics lien again. I would give the uh, one good, one more good faith opportunity so that you get something in writing from the from the tow company. So look, you, you participate in the theft of my vehicle. Call it whatever the hell you want. You took my vehicle on behalf of a bunch of uh, criminals. And um, I'm giving you an opportunity to, to, to make me partially whole here. No? All right. And then you, you file a mechanics lien against them. I know it sucks using the county recorder's office, but what other choice do you have? You still have to file in small claims, so you're still having to use the system to try to, you know, to get something back from what they stole from you. Uh, exactly. Now, I figure I have one other recourse, just not really for, you know, S's and giggles, but I figure that, well, especially since tonight being the first Wednesday of the, the new year and they hold their city town hall meetings and everything show up to city hall where I do ne definitely know that the city attorney, the mayor, as well as the police chief will be in attendance and to basically do as you did. Take your five minutes and question each one of them on this issue. Not that I'm actually going to get a response because like they say, you can go ahead and you can go ahead and bring up issues uh, in front of the microphone. doesn't actually require that we have to respond to it some do respond some are like scottsdale i don't go to scottsdale anymore because i you know that's they, they they say at the beginning they're on a, they're not there they're just there to hear they're a sounding board only. right so i go to you know when i do go i go to places like tempe where they do respond to your questions so find out in advance you know, find out if they do and bottom line what you could do is you can get it for video for the show and uh you can also tell them I will put this to you in writing, and you can respond in writing. You don't have to respond now. So if you've got a policy where you don't have to, you could just sit there like an idiot, fine. I'm going to put it in writing, and uh, if you don't answer it now, maybe you'll answer it when you're in discovery. Definitely you, sounds yeah, good. But you're going to answer. Yeah, let us know when you're going. Uh, we definitely want to see that. If you get, you know, definitely get some video of that. Remember, it is, I know that you guys operate under the presumption that just because I'm physically in California, your constitution and rules apply to me. I get it. I just want to know if you have any proof. You have any evidence that that's true? Sounds good to me. Um, one last question. 
I'm I ended up trying to get some information over to you, um, which was basically my court records and everything from my last court case, which definitely shows that uh, your method uh, works, and um, I have been unsuccessful to do so. So whether it's now or offline, can you put that information out again so I could get that uh, information over to you? Yeah, uh, I can do that now. It's markstevens at mail.com. You can always get the email and contact information at markstevens.net. I have multiple email addresses there. You can always drop in Skype. It's Frank Rizzo 3 And and we'll get it some way. So if, if uh, you know, just you can always, if you're having a problem with the attachments, which, you know, just email me without the attachment. And uh, and if there's still a problem, we'll we'll probably have you drop in Skype. Sounds good. All right. Hey, Tony, good. Thanks. for. I appreciate the call. Please keep in touch and let us know when you're going to the city council. I definitely will. And thank you, Mark, for everything that you're doing, man. You're, you're doing the good fight. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Tony. Tony in California. Well, what a bunch of criminals just stealing a man's car. You didn't give us enough money, damn it. We'll steal your car. All right. We got Tony uh, Jay in Texas back. Hey, can you hear me all right? I can. Don't breathe into your phone like that, though. Okay. It sounds like a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's louder than I you think. I have no idea what, what, what's that. I'm sorry. It's just that it's louder than you think it is. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what happened. My phone went completely dead. I had to take the battery out and restart my phone. I have I couldn't even call you I, back. Okay, not so a problem. I apologize we'll, for that. that. No problem, but we're back now. And if, if you didn't get to hear, if you have any other questions, uh, shoot. Uh, actually, I did. Uh, in Like I said, perusing through your book, I did see something, and I've seen this on several other uh, – in some other places – when you file for appeal, you have to put up money. Is that is that correct? In some appeals, yes, you do have to do that. They want an appeal bond, yes. And there is absolutely no way out of that other than to file for a waiver or a deferral. I have no what, remedy. What grants you... What, what would grant you those, those that, that, that deferral or waiver? Uh, you know, we went through this recently with someone in Chandler here in Arizona, and it has to do with just an inability to pay. And, yes, you're going to have to give financial information. Otherwise, if they're demanding that, there's no way around it. Okay. And that is based on, from what I understand, that's, that's going to be based on the actual, like the the original bond or it can be unless you're in Texas and in Texas, it's pretty bad where they can ask for three times the amount of the, of the fine. Wow. Yeah, I know. So, Someone tell yeah. me what's the logic behind that. Oh, to be a, there is no logic behind it other than they're a bunch of criminals. Well, the logic behind it being, Okay, you know, he's going to take this to appeal, and he'll probably win, and therefore we're going to make it as difficult as possible for him to take it to appeal in the first place. And really, their only way to do that is is through the wallet. Well, it, it's all about the money. I think it's even if you've got a situation like we, we've had so many times where the judge is taking the testimony of a witness he just declared incompetent. And, yes, that happens all the time. Um, I don't remember ever where a witness was declared incompetent. Even with the IRS, where they refuse, they always refuse to strike the testimony. Why? Because they're so biased in favor of the judge. But even in cases like that where the judge is declaring the witness incompetent, still taking the testimony anyway, um, they probably, this is the way, and I think you're right, and we're kind of you know speculating here, they figure there's no way for this to survive appeal because the error was so bad, according to the Supreme Court, that there's you don't even have to show prejudice. So they charge you an arm and a leg for a bond. But th- get this. The bond has to be given back if you prevail. So what I think they do is they charge you thousands for the transcript, and that you don't get back. Uh, and, and so we've had it where, like with our friend Bill up in New Hampshire, he had a licensed court reporter 
transcribe and provide a, a, the transcript for an appeal. That son of a... I got to watch. That Nicholas Court actually argued it wasn't from an approved Supreme Court source. He never challenged the veracity of it. Never said it wasn't accurate. He just didn't like who did it. And the bastard prevailed. That He still prevailed. Wow. And I said, wow. it, it, what is Nick doing? He's throwing his head in the sand. It's that it's the three monkey defense. No, I don't see it because it's not approved. And because we had argued, if there's a question as to the accuracy, fine. Have a copy also that you know you can have a copy of the original recording. No, this piece of garbage, this this criminal, probably upset because he was never appointed judge. That's what they do. So wow. yes, it is to it is to get as much money out of you as phys, as possible, which is why you know, like in places like in Missouri, where you know they've come under fire because there are so many people sitting in jail just because they can't pay a two hundred dollar you know fee. So they put them in jail and they collect it from the back end by filling all those damn seats. And we know that they right. get kickbacks from having as many people in jail as possible. And yes, the kids for you know kids for cash is only one example where they got caught. But to say that they were acting in a vacuum is insane. I wish that somebody could do an investigation and find out how many legislators and government employees, such as judges and prosecutors, actually have stock in companies like CCA with these private you know, private prisons. And I and I would imagine that the results would be enough. For even someone like Bill O'Reilly to say, "Oh, all right, guys, this is bad. This, this this is bad. I can't carry the water for you on this one." Right. You can't 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 look away from that one. But well, well, you know who knows. But that's something that needs to be looked into. So it's unfortunate that they, uh, you know, that they get away with that. I wish that I had a remedy available that I knew about because I don't think there is one to get around the, the the bond issue. I know when you initially go through, like in California, and they want you to put up a bond just to be able to file paperwork or get a hearing on a motion to dismiss. You know uh, that we've been able to get around. Not every time, but we can, because it's a matter of talking to the clerk. Do you have any evidence that there's jurisdiction to require a bond? Oh, you'll have to talk to the judge about that. Fine, I'll go talk to him right now. And we can get around it. Again, but here for the appeal, I don't know of a way to get around it. Sorry. Wow. Well, right. you know, not that you recall, but, you know, I work for myself, and I don't have – I really don't have any records of my income. So it'd be easy for me to go in and say, I don't have any money. And at the very most, I could show them my bank statements, which, you know, I just, I, I can move money around. I can do what I need to do and show that I'm, you know, basically insolvent or indigent and maybe you get around it that way. I mean, if I have to, I will, because that's what the whole, that's the scope of this is getting into the appeals court, which brings up another issue, and that is we know that all judges and lawyers are criminals and thieves and liars. So how is it that you achieve success in an appeals court that's full of the same kinds of people? Well, I was going to talk about that, about the appeal procedure, and so one of the issues you want to look at is you have to look at something where the judge has no discretion. It's extremely important for any appeal. If the judge has discretion and it's a government attack for a code violation where it's malo prohibita, you're going to lose on an issue of discretion. That's just the way it is. You, okay, so we're looking at errors where the judge has no discretion and are so bad that even these criminals in the appellate court tend to side with us, which they do. And why well, wrote in Adventures in Legal End, you have to make it a, a Dan if you do, Dan if you don't situation for the appellate court. So what you do is you put two conflicting or contradictory issues or uh, rulings from the judge. One is, like I mentioned before, you ask the questions on cross-examination and the judge declares the witness incompetent in an effort to protect the prosecution. 
You then have him deny your motion to strike his testimony. Now, those are two contradictory rulings from the judge. One of them is wrong. And only a, an idiot would think that they're both right. One of them is wrong. Uh, you also have the fact that, and this is a big one, when they deny you cross-examination, usually in a fit of, of just fire-breathing rage, they won't allow you to put on a defense. They say, that's it. This cross-examination is over. You're guilty. F you. Pay me. And not giving you the opportunity for a defense is a denial of a fair trial. So, uh, we, you know, that's a big issue. You also have the judge not presuming you innocent. That's a denial of due process. So, uh, we've been successful on appeal because the judges consistently deny us uh, effective cross-examination and consistently deny us an opportunity for a to put on a case. Because it not one hundred percent. Anyone who says they can win one hundred percent of appeals is is an, is is, uh, is 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 a criminal, and anyone who believes that is an idiot. Right, right, and yeah, they're just setting themselves up for a, a precedent or a, you know a, an opinion that they'd rather not prevail. It, yeah, you, but you, no, you know, I I don't I don't buy that, Jay, because one, you're not setting a precedent from a traffic court unless you get it into the court of appeals or the Supreme Court of the state or the Fed, and you're no. And you're not going to be setting any kind of precedent because all you're doing is getting them to uh, – it doesn't set a precedent to prevail on a denial of, of, of a fair trial uh, because the judge denied you an opportunity to put on a case. That doesn't set a precedent because that's already part of due process. There is no precedent setting. My having a judge okay. – grant so that's not the issue uh, there, there you know, that it's going to set a precedent. It doesn't. It's just like another one of the issues we're bringing up is the Brady violation, the prosecutorial misconduct. We can have the prosecutor on record and even the judge saying he doesn't have to prove that, which he is arguing without evidence, and the judge is holding it as irrefutable. That's a violation of due process. You can say, Mark, you may ultimately have been proven wrong, but, but you have to be given the chance that's what a fair trial is. A fair trial is so that both sides, if, they're, if the defense wants to, is to put on a case. And if you don't allow a challenge to the prosecution's arguments, that by definition is a denial of a fair trial, and that is a due process violation, and you don't have to show prejudice. The fact that is that's required to have a fair trial, and they're not giving it to you. So it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer. And this Brady violation thing is huge. We've read here on where judges have said that Brady violations are at an epidemic level. So it is an issue that the appellate courts are listening to. And it's not something that our philosophy as an anarchist uh, comes into the picture at all. It's nothing to do with, oh, he doesn't think the laws apply. It has everything to do with the prosecution meeting their burden of proof. And so if they throw it out because the prosecution failed to comply with Brady, that doesn't set a precedent. No. Okay. Right, right. So now when I – getting back to when, when I call Florida, when I call the state's attorney's office in Florida and make them aware that of my intentions <laughs> – how exactly do I phrase that to him? Do I say I'm I'm going to file for a Brady request, or will you allow me, or you send me the proper paperwork, or I mean, exactly how do I ask him for this? You you let him know I am going to file a formal Brady request. I'm asking you right now for Brady material. Brady material, okay, okay. I want to know the name. And a, say and ask him. Do you have a witness with personal knowledge? that the Constitution and code apply to me just because I was physically in Florida? Yes or no only? Yeah. Got it. Got and it. then if he says yes, what is his or her name? Now, let's say he can, get, Well, I don't have that. Uh, well, yeah, I don't have that in front of me right oh, now and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then another follow-up. Oh, okay, then uh, since you're saying you have a witness with personal knowledge of such evidence, could you just at least tell me what that evidence happens to be? And of course, we'll we'll get into that. Uh, uh, well, you were in Florida. That I understand. Doesn't answer yeah. the question. And you can say, yes, I understand. I was in Florida. How does being in Florida prove your constitution applies to me? 
exactly. And we'll, we'll get into that, uh, uh, as you put it, moving the goalpost and uh, uh, circular logic and, yeah. Uh, well, um, you can tell yeah, him, like sir. You can say, sir, in addition to the other motions that I'm going to file, I have no problem uh, filing against you for prosecutorial misconduct. Now, you can either show some good faith and answer the question now, or we can do it at, at, at a hearing for prosecutorial misconduct. I don't want to do that. I just, I'm here to try to resolve this. If you are interested in resolving this, then just answer the question. And we can, this can all go away with a plea of guilty. Ah, getting back to the, uh, and at that point he's going to, oh, so you're really to play guilty. Yes, I am. As soon as you provide me with the proper evidence, with the proof. Yeah. If you have proof that the court has jurisdiction over me, I like to see it. If right. you have proof that your codes apply and that it was even remotely possible that I violated them, yeah, I'd like to see it. And so, you know, basically, I want you to tell me that you can make a prima facie case of evidence against me at this point. And then if you can, yeah, I'll, I'll plead guilty right now. Well, I'll plead. I'll 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 plead guilty. Uh, you know, and turn. You know, do the whole turn myself in, whatnot, except whatever punishment you recommend. No problem. Right, right. Now, is it? Uh, is it gonna? Is it gonna make a difference? You know, the fact that I'm calling him. Am I going to call? Am I going to tell him that I'm calling from Texas? Am I going to lay out that kind of that groundwork that ultimately, if it comes to it, I want to do? You know, well, that will be telephonic. If I get him on the phone, but that's not. Well, it's not. Cool. I mean, should I let him know? But if it, if it comes up, if it comes up, I would stick to know that his patience is not going to be uh, too much. Uh, so keep that in mind. His right. patience is going to be. So yeah. you, I would get right to the Brady material. I would make sure and keep a date. You know, mark down, write down the date and time that you called, and the guy. You know, the name of the individual you're speaking with. Go right for the throat. I'm going to be filing for Brady material. I'm asking you right now for Brady material. I mean, this is my first formal, requ my first request for Brady material. And then, like I said, do you have a witness with personal firsthand knowledge your constitution and code applied? Just because I'm physically in Florida, that you know, and then right, and and that's okay. your that's your starting point. Right. Well, see, I'm I'm kind of playing this out in my head and thinking thinking ahead that I'm going to call. Oh, well, he's not in the office. If you can give me your name and number, I'll have him return your call. Well, as soon as they see 817 area code, they're going to know it's not local. And so that's going to kind of open up that. He's going to, you know, where are you at? Well, mm -hmm. you're not answering I'm any not questions in like that. And you can say, it's, well, you know, the thing is 15 years ago or more, having a, a an area code like that was an issue. You knew somebody was probably calling from, but I, you know, but now just, be, you know, I've had people call with a, I've had people living right here in the Valley call with a California, you know, cause that's where they're, you know, their, their, uh, cell phone, cell phone. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, my, my physical uh, location should not have any bearing at that point. No, the, nothing has the only thing that's relevant on that call that, and you should not be discussing anything else is the Brady material, sir. I'm only interested right. right now in the Brady material. Do you have, and then stick to that. And, and if you're going to refuse, then I'm going to make a notation that you're not going, you know, you're already refusing to comply with the Brady request. No, 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 and he may holler and, you know, and say, I'll respond in writing. Really? And then get a commitment like I did with that one prosecutor. Are you telling me that it, it, you're going to be responsive to my Brady request? So I'm asking you in writing for the name of your witness with personal knowledge, the Constitution, and code apply because I'm physically in, in Florida. You're going to actually give me a name or say that you don't have such a witness. See if you can get him or her to be responsive to the question, that they will be responsive to your Brady request. Don't settle okay. for this crap. I will respond that the what is, is that honestly is that something that these lawyers are taught in law school be as vague as possible unless unless someone has a pile of effing cash on your desk you ought to be as vague as humanly possible and or at least as vague as the judge will allow you to get away with is there a class on being a vague douchebag because it's called law school. It's called law school. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's, that's why I've said to people, I've said to friends, people I thought were friends, 
I said, is it remotely possible for you to give me a, a straightforward, unambiguous answer to a question, or do I have to put $5,000 in your hand? Is that the only way you can answer a question straight ahead, straightforward? Good Lord, man. I, I, there's actually someone I will not even communicate with anymore because he was such a douchebag, and he clerked for uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals here in Phoenix when he went through law school. And I think somewhere along the line, he picked up, it doesn't matter how friendly you are. You can't even have a friendly conversation with these people without them being so vague. It's a serious character flaw, to, you know, in, in my opinion. That's my Well, opinion. it's, you know, it, it falls back to that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sociopaths. They're psychopaths. They don't think like normal people. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them do happen to be. I think a lot of it has to do with just like that attorney up in Saskatoon. I forget her name off the top of my head now. She, um, she said, I don't want you to hold me accountable to what I say right now. I'm like, you want to be accountable for exercising good faith and saying that you're going to be responsive to somebody? What kind of a, what, what, what kind of an, uh, I was like, well, what kind of an idiot do you take me for? <laughs> That's how I'll put that. All right, we, well, we're almost... kind of the, uh, uh... I'm going to tell you something, but promise not to laugh. Well, I can't make that promise because you haven't told me yet. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm... something. Don't get mad though. If you, if you tell yeah, me you right? just if you if you're going to tell me you kick my cat, uh, well, we're we're about out of time here for this broadcast. We get a lot more information, a lot more a lot more content in this uh, in this hour than we would on the live broadcast on Saturdays. But uh, we we pretty much burned uh, the time. So uh, any any last uh, questions? Well, no, uh, I just was going to tell you, I'm probably going to go ahead and get your other book as well, because it sounds like it's, I think the two of them together, you know, just more knowledge is more power. Um, because it sounds like you, you referenced that quite a bit. And, and as I haven't read, the, obviously I haven't read all of Government Indicted yet. Like I said, I've kind of perused through it, and then I'm, now I'm kind of concentrating on part two, because that has relevance to me at this point juncture oh yeah um and i think i'm also going to go ahead and uh get one of your templates i'm going to go ahead and get the motion to dismiss template just so i'll have it in front of me and i can look at it and and understand the structure and the context um that being said you decide i mean because you, you you only have just all I've seen on your store is just that one, just the um, uh, the motion to dismiss. If there are others, perhaps you can be the judge as to which one you think I need for this particular case. Well, there are other ones, and it depends on the circumstances that I'll and on. I send those out to people. Uh, they're kind of like follow ups, like the motion to dismiss for prosecutorial misconduct. But I don't send it out with everything because I don't want to overwhelm people. Uh, you definitely well. You want to just change, the, get the template, and you just change it to motion to you know motion to quash instead of motion to dismiss. You're still going to file both, but you need to get that motion to quash the warrant heard right away. Um, and you want to file a one page motion to uh, have it heard telephonically. So. Okay. Um, well, that being said, I'll be shooting you. Uh, uh, you know, I'll be I'll, I'll go into the store and I'll make that purchase those purchases and uh, and then once I've got that in hand, I think maybe it'll make a little more sense to me how I can go in and uh, restructure or you know just change exactly what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah, you just because have to put in it, change it from motion to strike, dismiss to motion to quash, and you just have to put in the in the beginning there that. You're, what you're looking to do. You're not looking to dismiss the complaint at this point, not with that motion. It's the other one. You just want to put in there to reflect that this is to quash the bogus warrant that was issued so that your life isn't in jeopardy much for, much longer. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, listen, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I have you as a resource and uh, because it's, it's, it can be a very intimidating battlefield to walk into unarmed. Oh, well, um, yeah. And even and even uh, and I wanted to talk to you before I made that phone call because I kind of want to, you know, I want to go in there, you know, with my guns loaded and, and be able to, you know, uh, uh, logically and, uh, you know, effectively give him the basically give him the terms. You know, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I want you to do. Where we go now, and I'll be ready for his bolstering and. 
yep. uh, his madness and and uh, and either he concedes or he says, you know, up yours. Uh, well, well, real go, quick, okay. do do the role playing with the Skype in the Skype chat, the No State Project Skype chat. So for you and others who are who are you know prepping and getting ready for court, Frank Rizzo three, get into the Skype chat, and that's what you do. Uh, your audio is getting pretty bad at this point, so I'm going to let you go. I appreciate the call. Uh, that was uh, Jay in Texas. Appreciate that, and definitely keep in touch with what's going on. And if you need help, you or someone else that's prepping for court and you want to call the prosecutor, if you want a helping hand with that uh, as part of a consult that uh, you can get at markstevens.net, I'm happy to help with that. I don't have the time to get into all the issues about appeals that I would have liked to, but hey, no tech issues from my side. So, you know, that that that's pretty good. I'll get this show, of course, posted on YouTube. I'll get the audio up in an article, uh, which will have the YouTube video also. But the separate audio uh, will be fine, will be posted with this. Hopefully uh, sometime today should be. Definitely the video will be available for those who cannot li- listen live. But I will say for the for the uh, appeal after they have falsely convicted you. Uh, you do have 10 days to file an appeal if you haven't filed a motion to reconsider. You also have a motion. Let's say if there was a jury trial, you can have a motion for a verdict, not with, motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict. So uh, you can do that. Yes, post-conviction relief. But if the judge denies the motion to reconsider or the motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict, then you can file your notice of appeal. And it's just a notice. That's exactly what it is. It's a notice of appeal. There's no argument in that. Now, it might be different outside of the U.S., but that's the way it is here. You don't file a brief until you get that from the appellate court. Or if you, like traffic court here in Arizona, you file your brief and everything with the trial court. I know they changed that about eight years ago. Kind of a really stupid thing to do. Um, I think so anyway, but hey, what the hell do I know? I'm just some schmuck from Long Island. So that's what gets it started. And uh, I do have templates available for an appellate brief. However, you still have to check the local rules to not only make sure that the margins are correct, because who knows, they may get a hair up their butts, and they want to change the margin for some reason after 80 years. Uh, But there's also instructions in the local rules to tell you how it has to be bound. So certainly if you're going from a county court into the Court of Appeals or from the uh, federal court to the federal Court of Appeals, you have to bind it. And it has the cover has to be a certain color. There has to be a, a so it, it's a little more involved. The arguments in there are easy, and I discussed some of them today. We'll maybe talk more on the Saturday broadcast. Well, we will be live. So the free conference pro the call issue, the call line worked pretty good there today. The issue was on the other end, uh, but we squ- we squared that away. Um, so, uh, yeah, tune in uh, to the Saturday show for more information on appeals because a number of people have said, what about appeal? Uh, I will throw this out, though. Your errors, you don't want to be an issue of discretion. If they are an issue of discretion, you will lose. Um, so keep that in mind. So you only want to have three, four, ma- five maximum errors that you want to bring up. And Every single one of them should dispose of the of the uh, the case, the, the verdict, or the judgment on its own. So, example would be denial of effective cross examination. If you had fifty more very serious due process violations, and they don't want to look into those, they can just look at the oh oh well. Certainly, he denied cross. Ex- if denying effective cross examination without waiver is is a constitutional error of the first magnitude. No showing of prejudice would cure. They won't look at the other issues. They don't need to because that issue dis- disposes of the entire case. So keep that in mind. Those are the principles that I look for in when I'm doing appeal, and that's why we're so adamant about certain things when we're going through the sham trial. Why we deliberately ask certain questions to get the program response from the judge and the prosecutor. So that's why when you ask the prosecu- the judge, uh, the, their witness, the police officer, did you determine on your own that the Constitution laws apply to me just because I was physically in Arizona? Yes, I did. They always let him answer that. But then when you ask him for the facts, suddenly he's not qualified anymore. Those are big issues. Those are big issues. Okay, so... Um, 
we're out of time here for the, uh, this is episode seven, seven already of the No Stay Project. It's January 4th, 2017, uh, live here on, uh, well, on Ustream, and then it'll be on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, which is No Stay Project, and uh, we'll have that up at markstevens.net. So again, until uh, Saturday, when we're live again, 